There's a sense of accomplishment once Easter is over and we move into kind of the final innings of the programming year. Uh, you know, we had a lot of special services related to Easter, uh, the Wednesday Lenten soup uh, suppers and worship services, Monday Thursday services, Ash Wednesday, and then we, we gratefully and with with great appreciation look forward to Easter Sunday when we see all these wonderful new or returning faces. But a lot of work goes into that for, I, I'm not speaking about just Gail and I, we just sat back actually this Easter, didn't we? Uh, but, but for all you all. And, um, but in addition to that, I assume that a lot of you had family commitments and that you had company that came and stayed with you or you had uh, you hosted a meal at your house perhaps and so you had to prepare a big meal and after everybody was gone clean up after that meal I know that at our house we finally had to get down to putting the Christmas tree away and we we are done with Easter or are we when Jesus said it is finished He did not mean it's time to take a break. He did not mean disperse. Make your plans for summer. He meant that work that he had done up and to the cross, that work that he did on the cross, was finished. And now came the resurrection. And with the resurrection, a new birth. A birth of the, what we now call the first Christian community. And this, to me, is the great unrecognized miracle of Easter. This birth. Jesus was resurrection, resurrected. But this church, in its current iteration, was born. First John tells us that through Jesus, life was revealed. And this is life. This community. It is a microcosm, a macrocosm of the greater community. It is, as I said to the kids, our laboratory in many ways for learning how to love those that we wouldn't necessarily love. Jesus didn't come to create disciples. He came to create apostles. But when he returned, what he found was that, uh, you know, an apostle means sent out. Well, these people hadn't moved. They were in a small, confined, locked space. He had to go through the door to get to his own people who were living contracted with fear and appear to them, this is not life, this is fear. And when he came back, he even had somebody, my name's sake, Thomas, demand that he show ID. This is not life, this is disbelief. But from that, somewhere along the way, we get ourselves to today's reading. The whole group of those that believed were of one heart and soul, no longer drawn in on their own fear, on their own sense of self-preservation. They shared. They worshipped. They made sure that nobody went without Go back a couple chapters to Acts 2. It says they devoted themselves to the teaching and fellowship. To the bread and prayers. What we do here. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done. All who believed were together and had all things in common. 
They broke bread together. They ate food with glad and generous hearts. They praised God. And they experienced goodwill amongst each other. They experienced goodwill amongst each other. Do we feel goodwill in this room? And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. It's an idyllic picture that the writer of Acts paints. And one that churches have tried to obtain, have tried to maintain throughout the years. It's a daunting task, though, because it's filled with people. And that's not a bad thing. People are good. Uh, But it it reminds me of a monastic uh, society that I'm particularly fond of in my spiritual home of Los Angeles. And I go and visit there uh, whenever we do get out to California. Heck, if we're in New Jersey, I'll drive there. All right? If we're within, like, seacoast, I'll go there. And it's this place that it's a very small place, and it's just off of the freeway uh, in Los Angeles. Now, if you know Los Angeles traffic, it is loud, it is congested, it is almost as bad as that mess on Snelling that has been there for 10 years and will be there until we all pass away. It is a chaotic place and then in the midst of this is this lovely place and I promise you that whenever I drive up to it immediately I notice a change of state I notice a calmness that I attribute to God it's not coming from me that's not in my hard wiring it's a spiritual community well last time I was there I showed up during, you know, usual open hours and went up to the door and I was locked. And, uh, and I thought, well, you know, maybe it's like Mac and there are 40 doors you have to go through before you get the open one. And then I thought, no, no, this is the door I've always gone through. It, it's, it's really locked. I kept trying it because I'm Mensa. And if I keep trying the door, it'll open ultimately. And 15 minutes later, uh, one of the monastics came along and said, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Have you been waiting for long? Yeah, but no big problem. Uh, Well, let me find out what's going on. This door should be open. And uh, I I just can't believe this. Uh, A half hour went by. And finally, somebody came to the door looking flustered, looking a little put off. Opened the door, and in I was allowed to this place of great peace. And I was reading, and people started coming in. Apparently, they had sounded the alarm. Everybody get in here. Get in here. All right, who was supposed to open the door? Why wasn't there somebody greeting? Why wasn't there... And then somebody came in and said, I don't care about what's going on today. I got some other complaints. You know, the yard looks like heck. This and this and this. And -and so-and-so is annoying and yada, yada, yada. And the woman who let me in was like, there's a guy here. Let's go outside and talk about this. All right? So these people have... Like, no capacity to do, like, low voice. And, and, uh, and, and so they went outside, and it was like a TV show, because here I was at a window reading, and <clears throat> they decided to have their impromptu meeting directly outside this open window. And that's when they opened a can of whoop on each other. Oh, my God, you should have been here opening this. You're on the schedule. Da, 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 da. Well, I don't care what you think about the yard. Look at the inside of the place. Hey, yes, so-and-so is a jerk, but we should love him anyhow. No, we shouldn't. He should stop being a jerk. Da, 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 da. And I thought to myself, this is it, isn't it? This is life in a spiritual community. (laughs) 
You can't run away from your problems. I would like to artfully move away from my problems with dignity, but you can't even do that. Wherever you go, there we all are. And the work is the community. I grew up in a community, a large community. My parents, and it's okay to say this because they're not here today, were, I think, a little bit indiscriminate in the amount of children they had. (laughs) If I were them, I would focus more on quality rather than quantity (laughs) of children. And that's not a lifestyle choice they made. I accept them. Uh, and so, as it is, it grew, you know, I grew up with six siblings, or five siblings, six with the anointed one here. Uh, and uh, I'm kidding, that's my sister. Uh, and life was difficult, but we stuck with it. We stuck with it for some reason. It wasn't perfect, it was what we had. Now, writing about, to get back to this, um, this monastic community uh, that I visit, Christopher Isherwood was actually a monastic there. Uh, if you don't know him, a great writer. Uh, he wrote Cabaret, um, I think is his most common writing, but wrote a ton of other books. Um, and in his journals he wrote, one's first reaction to all this, the craziness in the, in, in the community, is the world's reaction. Mustn't there be something radically wrong with this place if everybody is so hysterical? But that objection arises from the fallacy that the aim of religion is to make you happy in a worldly sense. It isn't. The death of ego was never supposed to be pleasant. And this misery may really mean that we're getting ahead with it. So let the squeezing process go on as long as we can take it. A good chunk of our Bible is composed of letters written to the churches as the church spread. And as part of those letters, it's dealing with the struggles that the churches had. Where two or more are gathered in my name, church politics will arise. Where two or more are gathered in my name, people will annoy each other. People will disagree on theology. People will be upset with each other about this, that, or the other thing. That's life. And that's life as a community. I got distressing news this past week that I'd like to share with you, and it's, I found out that this wall here is going to be painted. And for the past seven years, I've related to this wall as kind of a metaphor for this church's acceptance of me. It's peeling, it's cracking, it looks awful. But I thought, as long as this church can see that the importance isn't the building, isn't the superficiality of the individuals, isn't our lovability... Well, then maybe, maybe I'm part of this. Maybe all of you are part of this. I'll actually like it when it does get painted, by the way. So, I mean, don't, uh, don't not paint it on my uh, regard. I will hold on to that metaphor uh, in my memory. Uh, the John says uh, in his gospel, The light shines in the darkness. But the darkness sees it not. To the degree that we live in contraction 
like those first disciples in that room, to the degree that we live in a state of criticism, oh my gosh, we're not such and so a church. We don't have such and so a program. Oh my gosh, we take Jesus literally when we say, whosoever. And whosoever sometimes means people that drive us nuts. As long as we live in that darkness, we will not see that light. That light will be obscured to us. It's like if you've ever been in physical pain so bad that it distracts you from everything else. Except we have a choice in the matter. We can choose how we regard this place, how we regard each other. So I have a challenge for us. And it's a challenge that comes at the time of the pastoral search. It's not a challenge that I issue because of the pastoral search. It's a challenge I issue to run concurrent with the pastoral search and on and on and on until those little kids sitting in that circle down there are that size, are your size. In other words, forever. Can we welcome the squeezing of the ego? Of those things that make this place not just so for us. Can we remember that Jesus' first appearance was not to check out space for a new church building. Jesus' first appearance wasn't to ask people what kind of activities do you have going? Jesus' first appearance was to say a miracle has happened. Get out there. Spread a message of love. Can we, as inheritors of this great tradition, not enhance it with our quirks? Can we faithfully carry it unadorned to the world? Can we do it by first practicing it here? Because if we can practice it here, especially if we can practice it here, where the only thing we have in common is our faith, in the neighborhood for a lot of you, then how about in the communities we are in that are more intentionally engaged? So that's the challenge. And that's the miracle I'd like to celebrate today. It's not a miracle that relies entirely on this particular group of people. But by God's grace, we are invited to fuel it. And to bring it to fruition. Amen.